Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, maybe, depending upon where you're from. Um, my name is Fred Kellerman. I uh, work with uh, Avnet, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about black holes today. Um, I know a couple people here I personally talked to uh, and gave a really quick hand-waving uh, explanation of what was going on on the computer screen. And uh, this will be a bit more of an elaboration here. Uh, I have a lot of things to say. Um, the first thing I'll say is I'm not an astrophysicist myself. Um, I spend a lot of time as a working engineer. This subject is just fascinating to me. And uh, what really resonated is, is after the draw-in of the interesting subject, the problem, um, the signal processing involved actually is identical to uh, radio signal processing. So uh, the theory of signal processing to me is just like, OK, I can do this. But let me tell you about the, the entire system. So everyone here knows what a black hole is. Yes, OK. Or as much as any of us know what a black hole is, right? That's the truth of it. Um, black holes actually are tied in to gravity. So we started out a long time ago with Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, an apple fell on his head. That's the cartoon, right? And uh, Mr. Newton, um, he was a pretty smart guy. I think if they had patents back then, he would have had quite a few. Uh, distilling it down to kind of uh, beginning physics, um, Sir Isaac Newton kind of compressed it down also into one dimension. If you have two masses, and uh, there's a force between those two masses, and it's uh, inversely proportional to the distance squared of those two masses, and uh, I think he had already prior come up with his own units of, of weight and force and such. And so, therefore, he decided he needed a little g factor there to convert into his, his Newton units. So that's the uh, fundamental equation for gravity. And uh, it's really, again, describing gravity as the interaction of force between two things. It exists all around us. And, and that's how we um, kind of live with gravity every day, but this is a measurement of the strength between two things. So you and I actually have attractive force between us. It's just we're stronger than an attractive force, and we can back away from it, right? So let's take it a little further. Um, there was this person named Albert Einstein, who you've probably all heard of and aware of and seen pictures of. Interestingly enough, uh, I could not find any uncopyrighted pictures of Albert Einstein. The closest picture I found was the photographer who took the picture had passed away, and U.S. copyright law says that's okay to use. However, Canada does not obey that rule for copyright. And since I was giving the presentation in Canada, I said I, I cannot post a picture of Albert Einstein in my presentation. So Einstein actually went and did a little more deep thinking about things, and he came up with uh, a lot of different theories, and one of them was the general theory of relativity. Has anyone here actually read the general theory of relativity or the English translated version of it? I have not myself either. I was just curious if anyone had done that. Truth is, um, he did come up with this equation that said, uh, and really, and this is a very paraphrased version of what he did. I, I can nowhere come close to, to his thinking or, or even understand what he wrote down even. But he really came up with, he said, I've kind of got this real thing, and I've got that real thing. And if I kind of work out the equations of what everything is, I know I've got to have this gravity thing. And he extended it from a single dimension uh, into the realm of space-time. So he worked his equations, and he came up with the solutions to the equations. And the truth is that I read, he was, at first, his math was in terrible error. It took about three other people many years later to actually correct the errors of math, but his idea was correct. In the equation, this is a, again um, very, about as simplified view as you could get it. This equation now uh, is the solution to the gravity, not only intensity, but it's gravity as a field over space and time. And that, that is the equation that we have here. So H, now we're gonna use H, that's the actual force. Uh, of how much uh, the force gravity has given um, some other constants, which I won't go into. Uh, but basically, there's a picture here. If you look at this picture, here's the sun and here's the earth. And in this synthetically created picture, you have this grid. And you'll see there's a depression in the grid. 
And what that's trying to convey to you is that this mass here, this big mass and this little mass, the larger the mass, the stronger the gravity is about it. And there's a depression in space from that. It's distorting space. This is a great exaggeration. It doesn't distort space that much, but it's to impress upon you that the space is being moved from the force of gravity. And you can see the little depression from the Earth. Okay? If you're not Einstein, I'm not. You're not. None of you have read the theory of relativity, so I feel a lot more at ease up here. Just accept that gravity waves are physical ripples in space-time. And it'll make more sense to you, hopefully, by the time we get finished. All right. Here is another simplification of actual gravity wave. And now I'm showing motion, so now I'm in time and space. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Maxwell's equations. I was an electrical engineer, and uh, it was not my favorite subject. I, did, I, I, I admired it. I, I was never really good at it. Uh, if you're really good at vector calculus, you're good at Maxwell's equations. Um, Maxwell's equations and gravity waves have a relationship through a transform, but the analogy is, is not good enough to really, you should not think if you know Maxwell's equations, you really understand gravity waves. However, they are both different emanations of fields and waves. So what we're showing here in this motion is stretching. This is the action as a gravity wave propagates through space and it's fluctuating. It has two polarizations. So if you remember electromagnetic theory, you have an E field and a B field. Gravity waves have two polarizations as well. And the one is 45 degrees to the other. And that's kind of a mathematical construct. At the same time, there is a physical emanation of it. And so this stretching up and this stretching out, and you see they're linked together, that is actually how gravity wave has an effect on space. As it's stretching, it's pulling in the other direction. So those arrows are actually showing you how space actually moves as gra the force of a gravity wave moves through. All of us right now are doing that. It's just it's such a small amount that you don't feel it, and it doesn't really make any difference to it. But we're all oscillating, basically, in that manner. Now, there's also a superposition. This is just simplifying down to just one gravity wave. There's gravity coming from many different things. You're seeing a superposition of things. OK. So tie into black holes. Black holes and things out in space have incredible masses. And because they're large masses, they create stronger gravity force and gravity waves. And things are moving. So again, I'm not an astrophysicist, but this is a summary of the things that they've made public that astrophysicists are aware of as strong sources of gravity waves emanating from the universe. The whole subset of these things, they are looking for these things, but there are things that are easier to find from the signature of its gravity wave than other things. The other things and things that I keep talking about, there are two kinds of binary systems, two black holes, binary means two, two black holes and two neutron stars. And so all the, the rest of the presentation and the data that they've made public, they're actually searching for gravity wave signatures from two black holes. So you have black holes, they're drifting around, they find each other, and as they get close to each other, gravity gets stronger, pulls them together, they spiral around, and black holes merge into one final larger black hole. The same thing occurs with neutron stars. They are a different thing, but they're two masses as well, and the dynamics of those two things coming together creates a known signature. So they understand the model. You have a model of two large masses floating together. They understand how to predict and model gravity, and from that, they have a known signature that they can look for and the signal of, of gravity waves that are floating around literally uh, through the universe. So to make that point of those two binary things, um, black holes, here's a very simplified model. The black holes are the black holes. Right? And here's the actual equation in terms of 
mass size, so that's the m, and then how far apart they are, and then the speed about which that they will rotate as they find each other and start to spin. And that's all reduced down uh, again to this h, which is the force of the gravity wave. Okay? H, they call a strain. And I'm not sure of all the, the reasons um, why they call it a strain, but if you think of a strain of a stretching, something pulling, I think that's a tie-in. But mathematically, it's actually normalized to it's the delta of the length divided by the length. Those are the units. And we don't have in this equation uh, hard-coded numbers for size of mass, but the size of black holes that they know about and can detect, when you work out the numbers, you're looking at 10 to the minus 21 size of numbers. That's all the bigger that that force is, okay? And you've got delta L divided by L, and that also, the way these constants work out, you'll see later on, it reduces the units down to, to pretty simplified unit. So let me move forward. Here is actual, so you can get a better picture of my, it's hard to hold the mic and wave my hands, so I want you to watch this little clip. This is a, a simulation of a model of two black holes out in space that got close enough to fall into that attraction. So take a watch here. The ripple, that's time, space time again, the grid, and those ripples, those are the gravity waves emanating from the interaction of those two black hole masses. So they converge, they become one, and the movement stops. And so now you have a depression in space around where the black hole is, but the fluctuations stop. You no longer have a wave traveling. All right? Keep that, keep that in mind. So let me switch to the real world now. So I kind of give you the mathematical background, a real high level sense, some numbers. Here is actual uh, gravity wave detector. Okay? It's called LIGO. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer uh, Gravity Wave, Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is in Hanford, Washington. Um, each tube here has a laser in it. And the size and length, well, the length of that tube, it's a vacuum tube, is four kilometers long. And so perpendicular, this is four kilometers long. That apparatus is able to measure gravity waves coming from those black hole mergers here on the Earth. So what's inside of that? Well, real high level. You remember the H stretching and contracting that we had? Now imagine that gravity wave has traveled to the Earth, and this laser inferometer, this is the four kilometer tube, this is four kilometer tube, straight laser. This is a, a splitter here. It's a little more complicated than that. It's but for the purpose of discussion, there's one laser, gets split here. There's a mirror, and attached to the mirror is a calibrated mass. And the one thing that I didn't tell you is that, I did tell you, but let me rephrase it. Gravity waves, they compress space. They only compress things that have mass. Light does not have mass, right? Light is its own thing. So the laser beam itself is not affected by the gravity wave, however, the masses on the mirrors are. And so what they're doing is laser light, anyone know some properties about laser light? Two major properties of laser light that make it unique, monochromatic and coherent. Which means that you have precise, you can have precise control over not only the frequency of the light, very pure color, but also the phase characteristics of light. And Using that phase, this mirror on each side, reflecting this laser beam and combining it again, a little bit of oversimplification, but really if you think about two sine waves. If you take two sine waves and they're in phase and you add them together, you get 2x the sine wave. If you take a sine wave and you move it 100 degrees out and add them together, what happens? Somebody, what happens when you have 180 degrees out of phase, two sine waves, and you add them together, what's your sum? Zero, okay, right? And everything in between. So now you can have a little bit of an idea of how they're detecting gravity waves, right? Make sense to everyone? Somewhat? Okay. 
Let's have a little look inside. You could spend days just talking about the genius and the mechanical geniuses and the active controls and the servos. These are some major components, real world components of the system. They work on them in clean rooms. They are extremely calibrated. Those tubes, they're vacuum tubes. They have to keep the air out. That impacts the accuracy, right? Because the speed of light in a vacuum, they have to keep all those little holes filled over that four kilometer tube and suck everything out of them. The mirrors are fantastic. The, the materials that go into the making the lasers and the optics are just millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff, okay? I would love to own one of these, but that, that's never gonna happen, right? But this is something you can look up later and should if you're interested in mechanical things and, and adaptive servos and just optics. Like I said, there's a lot of really good material here. So I just wanted to give you a little bit inside of what's inside that building, all right? So here's, here's the limitation of all that, all right? Remember 10 to the minus 21? Number, okay? You have to find really small movements, really small signals. Here is a summation of effectively what the noise floor of the detector is. So that LIGO system detector. There are many sources of noises, displacement noises, which are simply vibrations. The earth is vibrating, it's spinning, we have earthquakes. Mechanical things have resonances, natural resonances. Those are, those are Vibrations, that's noise. That's noise independent of the motion of the gravity wave moving the mass. You also have to take the mechanical measurement and turn it into an electrical signal. And semiconductors have noises in them. And there are noises of interference that are coming off of the motors and other apparatus. So there's a, there's a general list here. And the, the takeaway is that this black line is the summation of all the noise. Okay? And the axis below is frequency, so that's, that's the frequency of vibration, and then this is the strength of the noise. So if your noise floor is here, you're not going to be able to find a signal too far below that noise floor, because the interference is going to wash out the strength of the actual signal. So your capability of how far away and how large or small of a mass, that's the limitation of what you can do. You have to get a clean signal out of that system. And the fact that it's a physical thing, living in, using a bunch of particles that aren't stable, or pieces that aren't stable themselves, that, that is as good as you can do. You throw more money at the problem, you can lower that noise, noise floor some more, you know, but you're still gonna have some noise. But given all that noise, and given the size and the strength, we are still able to detect these gravity waves from these black holes. This is a little overview, you can see the strain over top, and that's just impressing upon, you know, moving the masses again, but the takeaway here is that, so out of all that measurement, that laser signal gets modulated and, and turned into an electrical signal, into a photodiode, and then it's sampled. There's a digital analog, or excuse me, analog to digital converter, and the sample rate is only 16 kilohertz. And most of the signals, actually, um, for the binary mergers, they only pass along actually four kilohertz. So that's all the faster that the sample rate is. So they turn this thing on. It's not on all the time because they have maintenances and things that they have to do. They, they turn it on and they're just writing the samples out to a file and they're running it into signal processing equipment looking for the gravity wave signatures. So a little bit more about that. If you watch the video, and my hand waving wasn't so good with my mic, it's more impressive if I don't have the mic. Um, the signal that you're actually looking for is the same as what radar uses, chirp. And if you think about the movie that you watch and how they approached each other, and as they got closer, the force got stronger, and it spun faster, and the chirp is a sine wave whose frequency increases over time. So that, that's the signal that they're looking for. This is a perfect chirp of constant amplitude. This is actual measured data from multiple LIGO stations, and you can see it's, it's noisy. It's not as clean as the synthetic signal, but Frequency increases, and then there's the merger. And after the merger, it stops, All right? So we know what the signal is we're looking for, and that matches the movie. This is a nice summary of the events that they have detected with LIGO that they've made public. There are five events in the event catalog 
that you can also take a look at the data for. And the summary here is showing you, here's the size of the black hole. So we had two black holes here, solar mass. Solar mass means that many more times the mass of our sun. These two black holes were of this size, merged together and became this size. There's a little label here. And that label is, means that LIGO found that event and labeled it. And I'll tell you more about that in a short period of time. Okay, so here's a nice summary. So they, got five, they have five events. One of the events, this LVT, is too noisy. Statistically, it may be a false. It may not be an event. These other events, I, I don't remember, but it's very, 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 very high probability, absolutely real, within, beyond practical doubt. Okay? Nothing's ever 100% in the world when there's noise. But this LVT is on the borderline, and it's, so that's why it's LVT versus GW. Now what you're looking at is a picture of the sky. So I showed you black holes, they merge, they create the signal. Okay, where in space do they create the signal? Where are they in the sky? Each event that I showed you on the prior slide is the same events listed here. This is a sphere that has the sky around us projected on the sphere. Each event beside this color is where in the sky that the merger occurred. So you can see there's an uncertainty here across this axis, and it actually wraps around, it's kind of faint, and uncertainty. But look down here, GW170814, that's a very tight area. So they know for GW170814, in that portion of the sky, it occurred. And it's gonna have a lot of relevance here, Just bear with me. This is a picture of the Earth now, and these are the stations where they're at. So you have Washington, Louisiana, and there's a third one in the EU, and I believe it's in Germany, called Virgo. The two, the, the prior events, the uncertainty, they were only using data from LIGO, the two LIGOs, so they could only triangulate. They're using time difference of arrival. Gravity waves travel at the speed of light. They don't instantaneously arrive at the same time. So why it was so tight on the third one? They partnered with Virgo. That's the difference. Good question. The blue dots, there's about 70 of them, are visual telescopes. Thank you for reminding me. Stay tuned, it'll have a lot of relevance. All right. Let me just break down real quickly what the event nomenclature means. GW, gravity wave, 15's a year. 09's a date and the day. All these are online, cataloged at this URL. And this particular event, they've estimated 36 solar masses, 29 solar masses, merged into 62. The distance of that event, estimated a billion light years away. That's how weak of a signal that we're detecting and how long ago that these events have happened. I didn't mention, but they turn on LIGO about 2015. It's still on but the public data only goes up to about 2017, and these are the five events that they've told the public about. Right? Now, to give you an idea, again, to place your head how weak these signals are and how little that mass move, let me put some real numbers on it, okay? For this event, for this size of a, of, of, of a merger, half the width of a proton, 2e to the minus 18th is what that mass moved. That's it. That's also another way of thinking about it. It'd be a proportional equivalent to if Proxima Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away, one hair's width. And that great distance, if you scale that number up, they were able to detect that movement given all the noises that are here down on our, our planet. Isn't that incredible? If you want to get out the data yourself, I put some information in here. They've written a Python script. You can get it with MATLAB. You can uh, do it with C. It's uh, an HDF5 database format. Easy way is just to get their script, read LIGO, you can pull it up. I've got some hints in here about the data. I'm gonna skip it. Let's tie this back into Ultra 96, okay? This is a Jupyter Notebook. They've made this public. If you stopped by the other day, the Jupyter Notebook is doing the signal processing to find the signatures of the gravity wave. I had that running on the Ultra 96. If I had had more time and my boss would let me do 
funner things that I think are fun, I would have accelerated that signal processing because I told you it's a radio signal processing problem. All right? uh, I would accelerate on the FPGA. That little FPGA on there is in the ballpark of able to actually process a signal real time coming out of. It can process the signal, but there's a lot more than just processing 16 kilohertz going on. I'm telling you from my practical experience, you just have to believe me, that that FPGA is capable of running the real system. You might need a little larger one, a couple of them, but it's, it's in that ballpark. That's what you can get out of that, that FPGA. We have a Python framework. I'm running out of time, so I'm skipping some of this. Uh, but there's a Python framework that comes with a package called Pink that's going to be released for the Ultra 96 board on October 1st. And with that package, you get Jupyter Notebooks, and you can take this LIGO thing, pull it on the Ultra 96, and there's tools there. You can accelerate it on the FPGA. I'm going to leave it at that. You can ask me plenty more, more questions afterwards if you have any more. And I have another presentation later today that talks more about this Pink. Okay. Here's the Ultra 96 board system. We've got PS, programmable logic. I told you you can accelerate it. Here's an overview of the entire chip. You're probably very familiar with this portion. Most of the people I talk to weren't as familiar with programmable logic. I'm just trying to say what I just told you. You can, you can accelerate it, make it run a lot faster using the PL. And this is my little thing here. This was my fun part. I'm just conceptually, since I said it's a radio signal processing problem, this is my conceptual view of what I would put in the FPGA to process to find the black holes. Now, what I didn't mention before, so basically you're looking at this classic signal processing. Uh, and this would all be done in the digital domain. And I didn't know if you know what Z transforms are and FIR filters are and all that stuff. So at a very high level, I would convert it to complex number. I would build some kind of adaptive whitening filter because the statistics work out better when you have equal noise power across all frequencies. And I would be running matched correlators. What I didn't mention is we know what the signal is for those two events, but in reality, they're looking at over 250,000 different signatures. So you need a lot of horsepower, even though it's only 16 kilohertz data, you've got a lot of searching to do. The FPGA can parallelize that searching, and that's, that's one major benefit of it, okay? Here's the board, here's where you can get one. Um, here's the punchline, I, I wanted to get to this. I, I didn't wanna end on here, go buy this board, okay? I wanna get back to the black holes in the universe, right? The coolest thing. And I'm glad you asked me about the question. It'll make sense now. So this event is very special. The story goes something like a week or two after they partnered with Virgo. Got the third one online. It's 2017, August 17th. They did the gravity way fine. And again, another thing I'd like to say is being able to do the search fast, this is why you need to do it fast. You want to be able to find it. You don't want to have to wait a week later. Okay, here's why. Neutron stars have great mass. They come together. They do the same binary merge. When they merge, they emit electromagnetic radiation in the visible spectrum. Those little blue dots, those visual telescopes, they processed the signal, found a match, found the, the chirp. They told those 70 telescopes, look here in the sky. And with the third station, they got down to that narrow era. Those 70 observatories looked in the sky and watched the fireworks go off, which validates the entire system. So if you had any doubts that this is hocus pocus, it'd be pretty hard to fool all those independent visual observatories. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. I, I do like to talk about things, and I can go into a lot more details if you like. And um, I just thought it was a fantastic subject, and I thank you for your time, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>